What is going on, internet? Nerdlocker.com with this week's comic book reviews. I'm starting off with Batman Eternal number 13. Uh, this issue we see the, uh, Lieutenant Bard uh, come up with this super brilliant plan to catch the Batman as he gives it to Commissioner Forbes. And he's like, yeah, dude, let's go catch Batman. And then he does something really crazy. He, it's like the smartest thing anyone could do in this situation where the police commissioner is just letting these criminals go because they work for his boss, Carmine Falcone. And it is just, it's awesome. It's very well done. It is very awesome the way that they do this. And I loved it. Um, I've said this before, I really like how we're focusing on a lot of Gotham. It's not just a Batman story. But, uh, I mean, they're really taking time that each issue to show you what's going on with each different character. We also see Tim Drake, uh, who is my absolute favorite member of the Bat Bat family. I'm glad that he's involved in this as well. And I'm glad that his uh, interactions are really starting to involve Harper because she's a great character. And I'm glad to see that uh, she's going to be playing a bigger role in the Bat family, which just makes sense, honestly. But, um, no, it's, it's outstanding. It's a really, really good issue. I, I love what they're doing. I'm giving this issue four to five nerd skulls. Let me know what you guys thought in the comments below. All right, guys, coming here with my reviews this week. I got to do Victory is number 13, and this series has been uh, one of my favorites for a really, really long time, mainly because it's it's dealing with like a very uh, familiar concept in terms of like, it's like a Justice League, Avengers type of, type of team, uh, more along the lines of the characters like the Justice League, but then it's like Avengers in terms of it being real and like the way it feels, the way they talk, the way they act. It's like a more mature version of that, which is really cool. It's really refreshing. I think I've said that a million times and it's still in this particular issue that doesn't shine that that well because there's so much going on. Uh, so many dastardly deeds and uh, uh, crazy plot twists are happening within this book right now. So that is really cool and it's keeping it going. And if you're well versed in it, it's 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 really awesome and it's really fast paced and it's really interesting as to what's happening. But if you don't know, and there's like two issues left to go in this story, so you're probably lost. Uh, but I do highly suggest going back and reading all these. This one had me going, had me into it, had me totally wanting to turn the next page. So I will give this four out of five nerd skulls. Still one of my favorite books. Check it out, guys. Hey guys, I got a chance to check out Tech Jacket number one, which is a physical issue this week. Uh, if you remember last year, they announced that they would be doing a short, a digital short story uh, coming from Tech Jacket. Uh, and then it, it, it guess, I guess it got a big enough uh, out, outcry for a physical series that it came out with a new number one written by Joe Keating. Uh, I did like this story. Of course, it picks up with our main character, Tech Jacket, and his father, who backs him up on everything, on all of his adventures. And he's fighting uh, various aliens, aliens throughout the galaxy, but he does come back to Earth. Now, the book is great. The artwork is fantastic by Kerry Randolph. I re this, that is what really drove this book for me. I've met Joe Keating. He's a fantastic writer. But I, I, and I, again, I love the storyline of this book. But one complaint I had, and it's a big one, it has nothing to do with what's going on in the Invincible universe. Now, Tech Jacket t touches back down on Earth, so he's got his own problems. I get that. But what's going on in Invincible is huge. And I just read the, the, the issue that came out last week. And what happened in that issue was absolutely insane. And for them to leave out Tech Jacket in this big of a way, it really so, sort of upsets me. But I've met Joe Keating. He's a great guy, and his writing definitely sh shines through in this book, even though you're lacking what's going on in the Invincible book. The artwork is fantastic. Uh, I'm really glad that they brought Tech Jacket back as a physical book, even though Robert Kirkman's not uh, writing it. Joe Keating is a, is a fantastic uh, uh, writer for this book. He's, he makes it fun. The artwork is great. I'm going to give this book four out of five Nerd Skulls uh, because the story is still really good, even though... I really wanted to see what was going on in Invincible, but I'll wait until the last issue for that one. So check out this one, and I'm gonna give it four out of five. Hey there, nerds, Jim here with my comic book reviews this week. And first up, I have Big Trouble in Little China, the continuing adventures of Jack Burton and the Pork Chop Express. Yes, oh, and number two. Yes, that is a very long title. I wish they could shorten it, but it's still awesome. We pick up right from the events of the first one where he's making a deal that he has to go and get something and meet somebody to save the day. Um, it's him, Egg, and Pete. Pete is the demon that's attached to him that go on this journey. And in typical Big Trouble in Little China fashion, they're not gonna go anywhere normal. They're gonna go 
interdimensional, I guess. And it's cool because as always, we are Jack Burton and this is a world we do not understand. And we're like, say what? To egg, it's normal as all get out. So he just opens a portal. We drive the semi truck through it and we're on our way. Cool, right? Um, we go along, we meet some interesting characters. Uh, egg basically tells Jack to shut up and stay in the truck. Don't talk to anybody. Knowing Jack, he doesn't shut up. And that's what I really like about this is Eric Powell really captures Jack Burton's tone and voice and uh, just the way he talks. But not only that, how he talks like a smart ass, but he's really saying dumb things. And case in point, he's talking about an old girlfriend he used to have who joined this weird cult. And it turned out she was a vampire and he unknowingly just opened the drapes and she got burnt, died, and he's like, oh, I guess she just left me. And it's just, it's funny. It's humorous. I mean, don't look for deep, impactful, life-changing thoughts here. It's Jack Burton. That makes it fun. I will say, though, so far I have not met villains that I really like. Uh, Lopan in the first one, in the movie, was amazing. And then the three samurai that worked for Lopan were just, like, the coolest guys ever. And I don't feel like we've met anybody like that yet. I really do like Pete. He's not really an additional character because he did show up in the movie, but he's developed well. I really like him. I think he's funny, um, although he doesn't say anything. They play off of him. Uh, Jack Burton is awesome, and Egg is awesome. So I'm really looking for that villain for us to go up against. We might have found it at the, other, at the end of this. I can't give away too much. Definitely check it out. I'm going to go ahead and give it three and a half out of five Nerd Skulls. All right, I got to read East of West, number 13, and there is a fight to the death with death. I mean, not to the death, that just sounded cool to say that. But uh, we see death throw down with that crazy thing that happened at the end of the last issue where it was like, oh, what? what was this? What just happened? Um, this issue will really start to uh, unfold what I feel is gonna be like the next big storyline of this. And I just, I love this book. The whole idea behind it was so crazy to me that that's why I started reading it to begin with. And I know we're only 13 issues in, but I mean, that's a little over a year now. So you can see it's still going strong. Um, I just want to see what the big end game of all of this is. Because it's, it, right now, it's just outstanding. It's an outstanding book. The writing is awesome. The artwork is incredible. I give this book five out of five nerd skulls. Let me know what you're thinking. All right, guys. So I got to read Thor, God of Thunder, number 24. And this is like the last issue for a while. Until it, it's, it's going to get really crazy in a little bit. There's a whole... Thor's secret sister in the Tenth Realm story arc, which I'm really excited for, uh, and we're gonna, we have to wait wait till until September to get the actual next issue uh, of Thor. But it's not that bad because this ends really well. It ends this part of the story. It ends this time, and it moves. There's some big changes coming for Asgard, coming for Thor's story in general, for for Broxton. Like the things that they're leaving behind are actually really cool to kind of pick up a little bit later, kind of get you refreshed with something else um and the epilogues within this epilogue uh were actually really really sweet um really exciting to see what what is going to happen characters merging with things that have recently appeared in the god of thunder series um either way i'm so excited for this, this is one of, another one of my favorite stories story arcs characters takes on this character the way you're pushing this character forward what you're doing with them building off what people have done in the past, but even not even just in the recent past, but in the crazy past and bringing it all together and making it really awesome. I really enjoyed what's been going on in this and I'm excited to see where it's gonna go. So I'm gonna give it five out of five Nerd Skulls because it was amazing. I got a chance to read Rocket Raccoon number one, uh, written and the artwork is also done by Scotty Young. Um, I really, really love this book. I was absolutely floored by, I mean, I was really surprised by how good it was. Uh, the writing's fantastic, it's really dry, uh, driving, it drives you to the end, uh, and uh, it's really funny. Uh, the, in the background, you're getting a lot of Groot action, but uh, you, you're in the middle of a intergalactic wrestling match between Groot and some other slime creature, but uh, you're following, of course, Rocket Raccoon, the main character of the book, and he saves this princess, and you want to see where that goes, but this, ultimately, the sto this story is about Rocket Raccoon and him being the last of his kind in the galaxy, but is that really true? And that's what we gotta, we're going to find out in this series. Uh, that's what they touch on in this issue. Artwork is great. The story is great. I definitely am putting this book on my, on my list, so you should too. I'm going to give it five out of five nerd skulls. Check it out. So next up, I have Deadpool versus X-Force number one. Man, this was confusing because I didn't flip 
to the end of the book and read like the summarization, summarization, why would you? But it explained everything. So while reading it, we have Wade Wilson, Deadpool. He's back in the past and he got a time machine to go take care of some stuff. And clearly he's not a good listener. So he does whatever he wants. So he's back during um, fighting England in the Revolutionary War. Yeah, why wouldn't you, you know? And he's got his own little notebook of who he's going to take out and who he's going to allow to live. Not sure what the point is. Um, and then we introduce Cable. And Cable goes to meet the guy who gave him the ability to go back in time, which we find out is also the guy that gives Cable the ability to go back in time in the future. So it's very weird. But we also learn Cable doesn't know Wade and Wade doesn't know Cable. But how could that be? The events of this book take place before they met in New Mutants. And it actually takes place before Cable formed X-Force. So it's really weird until you kind of wrap your brain around that. You're like, oh, well now it kind of makes sense. So he forms a ad hoc X-Force team to go take on Deadpool. And by that, I mean we have Warpath, Boom Boom, Domino, and Cannonball. Yes, they've, some of them, all of them have been members of X-Force at one point or New Mutants at one point, but it's not your typical team. And right now it's not the first team that came to pass, so it's interesting. And now they're fighting a villain they don't know about, but we know about, so it's interesting. And it's not your modern day Deadpool, where he's got like four voices going on in his head at all times. The writers consciously went with the first incarnation of Deadpool way back when. I'm not sure they hit it exact, because I remember those days, and the Deadpool I remember was Mark with a Mouth, who would basically take the money and change sides in a war, whoever was paying him more. So that seems a little different, but I did enjoy this. I thought it was fun, and once I wrapped my brain around what was going on, definitely was fun. I think it can go in good places. I love Cable. I can't wait to see what he does with Deadpool. So I'm going to go ahead and give this three and a half out of five Nerd Skulls. I recommend you check, you check it out. All right, I got to read Earth 2, number 25. I will say this has been one of my favorite books in the New 52. Um... I'm sure this might just end up as sort of an else world, but I love that stuff. I really do. I love just alternate timelines of superheroes and what they could be and what happens. And we see a crazy Superman who is now, you know, the uh, basically advocate for dark side laying waste to the world uh, with his robot dead wife, Lois Lane, the Red Tornado and his parents. And he's trying to act like everything's all normal and hunky dory and blah, blah, blah. And Jonathan Kent's like, no, you're not my son. This is not what you'd be doing. I don't screw Dark Side. This is bull crap. And uh, something happens, and it's nuts. Uh, we get to see um, the new Superman, uh, the other Kryptonian they've been uh, having on sort of with the Resistance, and sort of his story as to why he's there, like what's going on with him. And I really like the idea of this other Superman. Like, we've always had, like, you know, Supergirl, Superman, but it, it seems like this, this person can be a match to Superman, being that now he's a villain. I just can't wait to see how this just falls out with everything. Still waiting to see a couple characters. I, I feel like there's some hidden ones we haven't seen yet. Really want to see that. All in all, this is a great book. You guys should definitely be reading it. And, uh, I mean, if you're not, there's a big uh, weekly series dealing with Earth 2 coming out in October, and now would be a great time to catch up on that because their weekly series have been outstanding. So I'm giving this book four to five nerd skulls. Let me know what you thought. All right, guys, so I got to read Futures End number nine. And this is actually a really sweet weekly book. It's bringing me back to the way 52 felt, where you have a lot of crazy story arcs going on. They're kind of intertwining. They're not really... Um, but it feels more like that. After all the other weekly books that have been coming out, uh, I haven't read Batman Eternal, so I will not compare that with this because I'm not sure. And it's also a Batman-centric book, so it's probably not even the same. But um, I like it in terms of it dealing with a lot of the side characters that are actually really, really super important to this giant, big, fleshed-out world. I really enjoy what's going on with uh, uh, the Hawkman and Frankenstein thing. Like That's actually really cool. There's a lot of cool, weird, crazy elements to this that that are really getting me excited. So I'm not gonna give too much away, although the mysteries are really running deep and they're all kind of like coming together, kind of. But I wanna see where, where this goes further. Uh, I cannot wait for this to expand a little more. I'm gonna give it five out of five nerd skulls. 
you check it out. So I also got to read Quantum and Woody number 12. Sort of a sad, painful issue because it's the last one. And I've had this happen before. When Acclaim died, Valiant went under, and no more Quantum and Woody for Jimmy, and it was sad. So I feel that way again. Now, it will continue in the delinquents, and I'm also sad because that means instead of having two awesome books, Archer and Armstrong, Quantum and Woody, I now will have my favorite characters on one book, but it's happy because I will get both characters. Anyway, on to this issue. It's a weird issue. It's definitely tying up a whole bunch of loose ends, and there's a fun little sort of flashback comic to the era of sort of Peanuts, Archie sort of feel to it, yet it's got the ERA in it with Edison, and clearly he's not going to be nice. So it's a sort of fun, evil, 1950s feel comic I thought was interesting, and it's right in the middle of the story. Eric and Woody are at it once again. They are just at odds. We're coming off of um, Woody being a thief, Eric not happy with, he sort of got backstabbed, both in trouble. But it's nice the way they tie up loose ends. The goat makes his appearance, his true appearance, which is nice. The ERA is just such a messed up group. I love them as villains. They are all over the place. They do escape, so hopefully we'll see them in the delinquents. I would like that. Not exactly sure. Overall, although the issue is all over the place, I know they're trying to wrap up loose ends. I thought they did a great job. And the way they left it off is sort of how I remember the original series and that now they are sort of real heroes, so to speak. They're more bounty hunters because they're getting paid for it, but they become the heroes that I was hoping we'd get to see throughout here as opposed to Woody to towing the line with being a villain. I really like that. I can't wait to see what they're going to do with Archer and Armstrong, who I love them. I'm not exactly sure where it's going to go. There was a little tease at the end of the book, a little preview of the delinquents, which I recommend you check it out. It still has the same humor, which I really enjoy. But Quantum Woody number 12, sad to see it go. I'm going to go ahead and give it four out of five nerd skulls. All right, I got to read Green Arrow number 33. Still enjoying the hell out of this book. Um, I like it's just a grittier feel, and I feel like, like the artwork is very like jock-esque. It's not jock, but it gives you that, uh, that uh, year one feeling, the big famous Green Arrow story that everyone just, you know, everything's copying now, like the TV show and all that. And that's what I like about this. I feel like that's kind of the feel you need for a Green Arrow book, because I know when the Green Arrow first came out with the New 52, I wasn't really a fan of it. I didn't hop back on until this storyline. And so far, it's been outstanding. Um, we have his little sister uh, in Seattle with him, and she's like, I'm the Green Arrow now. And he's just like, you have no idea what you're doing. And he's very, he's very like... Uh, possessive of the Green Arrow title and through some flashbacks with Diggle you get to see that and see why um, he feels that way. Uh, the ending of this book is a real big like oh crap what just happened between two very pivotal characters in the book. Um, all in all I really suggest picking this up. Uh, it, it's a good run and uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm giving this four to five nerd skulls. Alright guys so I got to read Original Sin number five. Now this has been a uh, huge, huge jaw-dropping book. Uh, in this one, we get a lot more answers. It's not necessarily that jaw-dropping, but it's a, kind of one of those nods like, ah, this is cool, that's cool, that's really sweet. Uh, but it was all really jam-packed and really quick, and it, it just happened really fast, and you're finished with the book, and you don't really feel like you're any further within the story. You just kind of know what's been going on, which makes sense because there's a lot of tie-ins, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of that. The story's going on not just in this book, which kind of sucks. I like when it's all self-contained, but it's Marvel, and they're huge, and... What are you going to do? So I'm still enjoying this, and I like that they switched up the artists for all the different time frames that they go through. That was really sweet. I saw a couple of my favorites. Uh, and, I mean, Mike Diodato is actually just killing it in general in the main book. Um, and I'm not a, even a big fan of his, and this is a really good book, so all around. So I'm going to give it 5 out of 5 Nerd Skulls as well. I did a lot of great books this week, and they were all deserving of 5 out of 5 Nerd Skulls. So check them out. So finally, I got to read Lazarus number 9 huge fan of this book. Greg Rucka has done an amazing job. I love it. I wish the issues were more closer so they didn't have to wait so long. Totally understand though. Do a great job. I'll be happy. This one picks up. Once again, you have all the waste people coming to Denver in hopes to being picked by the family. And we see the process of how they go about picking people to then serve the family. And by serving the family, that raises them up in status and they can live a better life. And it's not just the person they pick, it's the whole family that gets to be raised up. So it's cool in that respect. 
We also get a little flashback with Forever and Marisol. And we'd been teased with this before, and they'd been foreshadowing how Forever was going to handle the events of having to take on Marisol, her trainer, basically her closest friend, confidant, because she's in the compound being trained nonstop. And it's a really cool resolution. I was really happy with it. And the father seemed really happy with it, which was most important, especially to Forever. Cut back to the family in Denver. Forever's trying to keep her brother Steven safe. Steven refuses to listen. He doesn't want to take that. He doesn't care. He's basically doing what the family tells him, but he doesn't want to go to all these precautionary steps. I guess I can understand. We see politicians do that all the time. Um, but Forever is doing everything she can to protect him. Uh, we still have Angel on the loose. She is trying to track down Angel. We know he's got bombs, doing whatever he wants to do. And then we have Michael and Casey who are the ones who are trying to get picked up by the family. Casey has a nice little twist going on. Michael, the one that we see promise with because he was doing some um, medical stuff along the way, helping people out. He does get picked, which is very cool. But again, there's a great twist. I love this book. Not exactly sure where they're going after this because it seems to tie up a bunch of loose ends. I can't wait to read the next one though. I'm gonna go ahead and give this one five out of five Nerd Skulls.